welcome to our Sabbath school this beautiful Sabbath morning. We want to especially welcome our members as well as our visitors from Shady Point and Shady Point churches alike. It is so special for us to all worship together on the Sabbath, even if we are caught in social distancing at the present. Our lesson will be presented by Larry Rexius. It will be lesson four in your adult quarterlies. It's called, the title of this lesson is The Bible, the Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Let me say, if you don't have a quarterly, please let your church a secretary or a clerk know, and it will be sent to you. Let's just bow our heads as we begin. Our most gracious, awesome Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of coming apart and opening your, your wonderful uh, word of truth, the Holy Bible. And as the lesson is presented, I pray that you would especially Anoint the lips of Larry. Open our hearts as, as we hear these words given, and may it have a changing influence on our relationship with you. Uh, we love you. We want to serve you. Now, bless us as we continue our worship this morning, thanking you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. As we uh, <clears throat> begin our lesson study today, um, I just want to say that I miss each one of the Sabbath school members, and I miss being uh, having a regular Sabbath, and so I look forward to the time when we can be back together in fellowship and, and have a normal Sabbath school. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to remind each one of you um, that if uh, you have not forgot to um, uh, be supporting the Sabbath School expense offering, that continue to do that. Um, there are expenses, and <clears throat> as the envelope goes around to each Sabbath, uh, don't forget to set some money aside for that offering. Also, uh, at the beginning of each um, uh, lesson study, we ask if there's any praise reports. Uh, I'd like each one of us to take note of the things that we can praise the Lord for. And also, if you've been witnessing, um, uh, make, a, make a note of that and, and um, bring those witnessing moments to the Lord. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I don't know if you remember that program, Thunder in the Holy Land, um, where we were going out to meet people, and I had met uh, a man by the name of Josh Winters, and we'd been studying together for the last couple of years. Uh, just about three or four months ago, I sort of lost touch with him. He texted me this week, <clears throat> and say, hey, Larry, I, I love you, I miss you, and I want to get together with you. So I want to praise the Lord for that. All right. <clears throat> if you um, would uh, take your lesson books out and your Bibles, um, we want to begin our lesson study. I'm going to do a little bit, something a little different in, um, in the lesson this week. And I would like to start on Thursday's lesson. And the, the lesson title is How to Interpret the Scripture, the um, lesson book. Um, and so this, this uh, Sabbath uh, study is the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. And we're going to look at that in just a little bit, but I would, first of all, like to have you turn to Thursday's lesson, and uh, we'll talk about the Bible. 
Unfortunately, I haven't um, had the opportunity to listen to any of the Bible <coughs> uh, studies that have been given up until this time, and it's been probably five or six weeks now since we've had a, a, a Sabbath school program. Um, I believe that these lessons that we have in this quarterly um, are the providence of God supplying these lessons at just the right time. Uh, these lessons were, were written uh, months and months, maybe even a year ago before they were uh, given to us. And so I'd like to have you turn to Ezekiel uh, 33. Ezekiel 33. And we'll read verse 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. We are living in a time when God's word, the Bible, has never been attacked as it has been before. And there's a, um, a prophecy in Amos 8, 11, which uh, most of us are familiar with, but I'd like to have you turn there. Amos 8, <coughs> Verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. Satan has hated the word of God from the very beginning. That, that hatred began in heaven, and it came to this earth. In, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Satan lied to Eve, and then he turned that lie against God and accused God of lying. Down through history, Satan has used every possible means to destroy the Bible. During the Dark Ages, the Bible was chained to convents. The people's only access to the Bible was through the priests. Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, the Waldenses, the Abigenses, and many others gave their lives, <clears throat> gave their lives to protect the Bible. Uh, there's a reference in Great Controversy, page 51, it says, <clears throat> Satan well knew that the Holy Scriptures would enable men to discern his deceptions and withstand his power. It was by the word that even the Savior of the world had resisted his attacks. At every assault, <clears throat> Christ presented the shield of eternal truth, saying, It is written, <clears throat> to every suggestion of the adversary, he opposed the wisdom and power of the word in order for Satan to maintain his sway over men and establish the authority of the 
papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. The Bible would exalt God and place finite men in their true position. Therefore, its sacred truths must be concealed and suppressed. This logic was adopted by the Roman Church. For hundreds of years, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. The people were forget, forbidden to read it or have it in their houses. And unprincipled priests and preludes interpreted its teachings to sustain their beliefs. Thus, the Pope came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vicergent of God on earth, endowed with authority over the church and state. And again, in the same book, on page 267-268, in the darkest times, there are faithful men who love God's word and were jealous for his honor. To these loyal servants were given wisdom and authority to declare his truth during this whole time. Men cannot, with impunity, trample on the word of God. The meaning of this fearful denunciation is set forth in the chapter, closing chapter of Revelation 22, 18 and 19. And if you turn with me to there, again, these are, are familiar words, but we need to look at them again. <clears throat> it says, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things where, which are written in this book. During the French Revolution, God's true witnesses were cast down to the ground. Satan tried to silence God's word, but the two witnesses stood up. And that's why we have the Bible, God's word, available to us today. The Bibles are so plentiful today. There's millions of them in the world. So how could Satan destroy them today with the millions of Bibles? 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Gives us the answer to that. <clears throat> Second Corinthians two seventeen. For we not are not as many, which corrupt the word of God, but as sincerity, but as of sincerity, but as the word of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So, Satan has gone about to corrupt the word of God. And he's done that with great success. If you um, look up the definition of corrupt, um, I, I use um, the, the 18... 28 dictionary uh, and in there it says um, minute to find it here okay it's the definition of corrupt means um, to dissolve spoil taint debase impure, 
not genuine, pervert, <coughs> to loose, uh, putrefy, render unsound, falsify, defile, pollute, change from good to bad. And the, the devil has stealthily worked over the past 60 or 70 years to corrupt the word of God. And gradually, little by little, he has worked to desensitize our respect and our love for the sacred word of God. Like the worldly things that have, have crept in among us, little things, we make concessions and compromise here and there. And it brings about a sinful condition. Why would Satan want to corrupt the word of God? And why would there be so many dozens and dozens of versions of the Bible today? Is there anything in the, in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy <laughs> that supports the fact that we need all of these versions? What do they do? They bring in confusion and disunity. They corrupt the word of God. The, the arguments they are needed is they're easier to understand. I have people say, I like versions. I like this version. I like that one. I like the way the translators interpret it. <clears throat> all in uh, Ministry of Healing, page 116, all through the ages, this is um, the first part of the paragraph, all th through the ages, sin has been strengthening its hold on the human race. All through, although through falsehood and artifact, Satan has cast the black shadow of his interpretation upon the word of God and has caused men to doubt its goodness. Yet the Father's mercy and love have not ceased to flow earthward in rich currents. We are living in the last days. <clears throat> We're accustomed to have everything uh, fixed for us. We got fast food. We got restaurants. We got uh, all these, these things in life are, are prepared for us. I... I'm wondering if this virus is not a good thing in a way. It, I've read on the, on the news where people are, are buying food and they're buying uh, uh, bread makers. They're running out of bread makers because people are starting to, to cook their food at home and, and they're starting to pay attention to nutrition. I ask you a question. <clears throat> when you pick up one of these new translations that men have been translating recently, can you say in your heart that these were translated by holy men of God that were moved by the Holy Ghost? Most, if not all, of these new versions were translated from corrupt manuscripts. There's only one translation that I know of that was <clears throat> translated from an uncorrupted textus receptus, and that's the King James Version. And I would encourage each one of you uh, to get a copy of the King James and, and read it. The, some of it is hard to understand, but the Lord has promised in um, 
John 16. If you turn there, John 16. Verse 12 and 13. It says, How be it he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but, so he, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. <clears throat> also, um, in um, John... 829 Jesus said and he that sent me is with me the father hath not left me alone for I do always those things which please him and in in choosing the Bible and um Choosing which version we read. Can we say in our hearts, I do always those things which please him? Or are we saying, I want this and I want that? Romans 15. Romans 15. Verse 3 and 4. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So let's... um, turn in our our lesson books to the lesson on Sabbath afternoon, the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. And I don't have much of a higher learning, so I, I wasn't sure what theology really meant. So I went back to my uh, 1828 dictionary again and looked up the word theology. It said there was, uh, I'll just go by memory, it says that there was two parts to theology. And um, one part was the natural part, and the other was the part of theology is to reveal. And um, the natural part is is nature, uh, studying the nature as um, uh, given to us by God. And as I thought about the study of nature, I thought about creation. Um, The study of theology covers the study of of God's creation. The um, part two of theology is is to reveal the revelation of God's word. And what is revealed in God's word? It's his plan of salvation from cover to cover. And we'll look at the memory verse. It says, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. To the law and to the testimony. What is the testimony? A testimony 
uh, testifies to something that you has, have witnessed. And uh, in John 5, 39, Jesus' words, John 5, 39, Is it, um, oh, I'm in the wrong, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong, wrong uh, book. <clears throat> John 5.39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So that's what the, the testimony is, is the testifying of Jesus and his love and plan for us. The note says, there is no Christian church that does not use the scriptures to support its belief. Yet the role and authority of scriptures in theology is not the same in all churches. <clears throat> so just like um, how do we figure out which church is the right church if there's uh, thousands of different churches in the world today? It's the same standard that we use in, in choosing what Bible to use. In the, in the note on Sabbath afternoon's lesson, it says, we all read the Bible and use it for our understanding of God and his will. <clears throat> and that's one of the most important things as we read the Bible and we open it up, that we look at understanding God's will. And what is God's will for us? Well, let's, let's look in the Bible and, and see what the Bible has to say about God's will. We'll turn to first, second, 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3, verse 8 through nine, <clears throat> but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. And <clears throat> the, this, this is important because God doesn't want us to be ignorant about his word and his plan. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward a, a, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So in this scripture, God has revealed to us what his will is, that we should, not one of us should perish, but all come to repentance. Um, let's turn to um, 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 through 19. Now that we understand that God's will for us is is not that any of us should perish. We have a responsibility. It says in 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
When we have been baptized and, and go into that watery, watery grave, we come out a new creature. We're, we're now man in Christ, and Christ is living in us. A new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. It didn't say that some things are new. It says all things are become new. Our lives are changed. <coughs> all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay, we'll turn to Sunday's lesson. Uh, before we do, I'd like to um, share a statement from uh, Selected Books, Messages, Book 2, page 368. In this time of peril, we can stand only as we have the truth, the power of God. Men can know the truth only by being themselves part by parta themselves partaking of the divine nature. We have need now far more than human wisdom in reading and searching the scriptures. And if we come to God's word with humble hearts, he will rise up a standard for us against the lawless element. <clears throat> and then in Desire of Ages, page 398, the submission of the precepts, the substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions, resting upon mere human authority, have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and, re and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. The, the note says traditions itself is not bad. We have traditions in our church. Some of those are we traditionally start our Sabbath school at a certain time. We conduct our service in a traditional way. We have traditions such as the foot washing service and, and um, the communion. Uh, there's no way in, in the Bible it says you should ever have it every quarter. But traditionally, we, we do those. So there are traditions that, that are good. But... Colossians 2, verse 8. There are, there are some warnings that are given to us in the word. Colossians 2, 8. <clears throat> Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after rudiments of the world, and not after, not after Christ. So we need to hold to God's word. And how do we 
differentiate between the philosophies of man and God's word. It says we are to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, to examine ourselves to see if what we're reading and studying is of, the, of, of God. <coughs> An examination, when you, when you take one, there's always an answer sheet to the questions that have been answered. And in God's word is the answer sheet to the questions that arise. The questions are, what is God like? What is Jesus like? Do we know his character? First Corinthians eleven two. First Corinthians eleven two. <clears throat> for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is saying that he is jealous with a godly jealousy. He's talking about the word of God, the truth, as it is in Christ. Second Thessalonians 3.6 It says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. <clears throat> We're not to, to, to uh, fellowship with those that are teaching and following the traditions of men. Bible says, what, what communion have you with the world if you're following Christ? Um, so let's turn to um, just uh, uh, down the Second Thessalonians 2, verse 14 and 15. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. That goes along with the Bible. When you see a, a brother in fault, it says, Ye which are spiritual, go to him in, in the spirit of meekness and, and attempt to restore him to the faith. On Monday's lessons, <coughs> this lesson is, is uh, entitled Experience. What is experience? Experience is, is knowledge that we have received from, I would say, trial and error, good or bad. I was, um, when I thought of experience, I thought of a, a story in the Bible that's told in Genesis 30. Verse 27. 
and this is the story about Jacob when he was deceived by Laban. He worked seven years for Rachel and then was deceived and had uh, and um, was given Leah and then he had to work another seven years for Rachel. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. So Laban learned by experience and, and uh, witnessing Jacob's faithfulness to the Lord and to him. And that's the experience that God wants each one of us to learn. And we, we learn and we uh, experience by opening God's word and looking at the life of Christ. And, and John 14, 9 And Jesus, um, 14, yes, I believe it's 14, yeah, 14, verse 9. Jesus said, unto, this is um, Philip questioning Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, have I been so long with you? And, thou, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip, and he that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? And then going back to verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father by, but by me. So when we study the life of Christ in God's word, we see the Father. We see the selfless life of Jesus. And if we want and are we planning to spend eternity with him, and we realize that this is not our home, We should be studying the life of Christ, his selfless life. On uh, Tuesday's lesson, culture. <clears throat> I had a little diff difficulty with uh, studying about culture, and the only thoughts that I came up with was, I remember... When I was 12 years old, I moved from Canada to the United States. And we had a different culture in Canada. The first thing I noticed <coughs> was going to school. When we seen a, a striped horse, we called it a zebra. Well, down here in, in the States, it's called a zebra. We don't, we, the, the Z is pronounced differently. And when you park your car, you park it in the garage. You don't park it in the garage because they don't pronounce the A as an A. So we are preparing for heaven and so we should under, un, be studying what heaven is like. Are we truly going to be comfortable in the presence of God? Are we truly going to have reverence and respect for his word and for his character? 
unless uh, this is um, in the note in Tuesday's lesson, it says, unless we have something anchored in us that comes from above, let me read that again. Unless we have something anchored in us that comes from above us, we will soon give in to that which is around us. That's why we're told to be in the world, but not of the world. We should not be fighting for our rights. And I should be removed from all judgments that we make. Wednesday's lesson talked about the, the reason. Second Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that is exalt that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your disobedience is fulfilled. So our reasoning should be... Uh, only as it's in the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God, if you look at the word knowledge, it comes from the word know, to know God, to have an intimate relationship with him. And this will bring us into obedience of Christ. That's how the terminology comes Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because as we are brought, all of these imaginations are brought into, uh, uh, are cast down, and Christ lives in us, then obedience will follow. We've pretty much covered the Bible in uh, Thursday's lesson. So there's a um, uh, added or further thought in the great controversy on Friday's lesson uh, from 593 to 602, and I encourage you to read that. It's, it's entitled Safeguard of the Scriptures, and these times that we're facing today the, the attack that was made on the word of God throughout history is being repeated. And don't be fooled and don't let Satan steal away your salvation by accepting all of the, the, the doctrine and the teachings of men that are going around. Um, there can only be one true word that we, we can study. And again, we're going to be <coughs> faced with the, with the um, prophecy of Amos. There's going to be a famine in the land, a famine for the word of God. And if you look at the, the famine that um, took place in the land of Egypt, there was seven years of good and plenty and seven years of famine. We are living in that, that time, the seven years of plenty. We have plenty of time to study the word of God, to uphold it, and to love and treasure the scriptures, the holy word of God. This, this lean time is coming. We have seen in just the last few months, how rapidly things can change. And believe me, they, they will change. 
we're living at the very end of the, the, the image that was portrayed in, in Daniel chapter 2. And the Lord is coming. And I pray that we would all be ready and have a new love and for God's word because of the, the lesson that has been given to us. So let's, uh, let's close our Sabbath school with prayer. And if you would bow with me. Father in heaven, we have prayed and asked for the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our thoughts and our words. And I believe, Lord, that you have uh, heard and answered our prayers. And as we go from here, I pray that we would have a new love and courage to stand for what is right, to be like Joshua and Caleb when the current is against us, that we would have the, the um, decision that Joshua made. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We ask that you'd forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that there would be nothing that would hinder our prayers from ascending to you and that they would be answered according to your will because we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.